Hello, friends. Your society president, John Dunhauer here. It's so great to have you join us for the 2021 Barbershop Harmony Society Virtual Midwinter Convention. I know that the whole virtual thing is not ideal, but wherever you actually are, I'm glad that you're here too. You know, the downside of having a virtual convention is the fact that we don't get to see each other in person. I miss that connection. I miss you. But there are a few upsides. For instance, in a normal midwinter convention, we'd have just one keynote speaker. But this year's virtual convention, we have not just one, not two, but three great speakers. I hope you all caught the Friday keynote by Henry Hicks, CEO of the National Museum of African American Music. And I encourage you to attend the Sunday keynote featuring the incredible Blair Brown, lead singer of the two-time Mixed Harmony Champion Quartet, Double Date. That will be at 4 p.m. Central tomorrow. Tonight, our keynote speaker will be Barbershop Harmony Society Hall of Famer, Kevin Keller. Kevin has been a member of the Society since 1978 and he's made quite the impact as a chorus singer with both the Vocal Majority and Ambassadors of Harmony, a quartet singer with a variety of great quartets, including our 2003 sixth place international finalist, Cheers, as a respected music judge serving as contest and judging chair from 2012 to 2015, as a sought after teacher and coach, and as an acclaimed arranger whose charts have been sung by the greats of the Barbershop Harmony Society, Sweet Adelines, and Harmony Incorporated. And there is so much more. Kevin's latest project is a labor of love in which he tells the history of the BHS contest and judging system in an 11 part series available for streaming on the BHS YouTube channel. I know what you're thinking, boy, that sounds boring. But you'd be wrong. Kevin makes our history come alive. I'm thoroughly enjoying it, and I encourage you all to check it out. You know, Kevin is amazing. He's met the world to our community and to me personally because he's my friend. With all of that said, let's get to it, shall we? Please welcome tonight's keynote speaker, your friend and mine, Kevin Keller. Thank you. I am both excited and humbled to be with all of you tonight. My talk tonight is about preservation. Although I appreciate the virtual avatar world, I need you to not only hear my heart, I need you to see my heart. I have been a part of Barbershop since June of 1978. Most of you don't know my story of how I got into Barbershop. I thought I would take a few minutes to share that. My story actually starts long before 1978. Had the internet existed, I would have been in barbershop far earlier. Um, my father always watched the Andy Williams show and the Jackie Gleason show out of Miami. I watched episodes of the Osmond Brothers and the Suntones. My mom had the Music Man album and I had heard the Buffalo Bills recorded several times. I saw barbershop quartets on TV, a variety of TV shows growing up and I absolutely thrilled to the sound. Although I grew up as an orchestra player, I loved hearing any vocal harmony, but especially barbershop. I had wanted to sing barbershop as long as I have memory. Now, my father was a great singer. In fact, in the 1960s and 70s, if you wanted a tenor soloist in the St. Louis area, you called my dad. He had a fantastic operatic tenor voice, first full voice, first tenor. He listened mainly to opera and symphonic music in the house, but he actually knew most of the music from um, musicals in the Great American Songbook. Then my life changed on the evening of Wednesday, June 7th, 1978. My dad and I went to a St. Louis baseball, uh, Cardinals baseball game at the old Bush Stadium. Ernie Hayes was the organist and he uh, played all sorts of songs from Tin Pan Alley and the Great American Songbook. My dad just boldly sang the melody everywhere he went. Uh, he, every song he just sang. And, and that was what I was used to in my life. And then the weirdest thing happened. Goodbye, my Coney Island baby. Farewell, my own true love, true love. All the way to 
And I'm 16 years old. I'm a sullen, withdrawn kid with very few friends. I was bullied in middle school. If an adult asks me a question, I respond with one word answers. I have slid down and as far down in my seat as I can possibly go. This was the weirdest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. Absolutely made no musical sense whatsoever. And after I finally recovered, I said, Dad, what was that? And he said, it's Coney Island Baby. It's a barbershop quartet song. And I went, immediately my attitude changed. I went, oh, I have always liked barbershop. And my dad went, really? Yeah. Well, your mother's, mother's friend's husband sings in a barbershop chorus here in town. Would you like to go? And I said, sure. But inside, I was doing somersaults and backflips. Do I want to sing barbershop? Yes, I want to sing. I've always wanted to sing. So nothing more was said uh, at the rest of the evening, on the way home, the next morning at breakfast, and nothing. And then the next night he comes home from work and at dinner he said, I spoke with Bob. They have a guest night next Thursday night. I'll take you over to the house at seven and then he'll take you on to the meeting. Sound okay? And I said, sure. But inside more backflips and somersaults, I was actually going to sing Barbershop. I couldn't hardly stand waiting another seven days, but the day finally came and my dad took me to Bob Rich's house which is about a mile away from where we lived. Bob and my dad are talking like they are old friends, which I really didn't understand. But eventually dad leaves and Bob and I drive about five or six blocks and there we are. The rehearsal hall where they had rehearsed was less than two miles from where I grew up. I had no idea. I later learned that night that their annual show was two blocks away from where I grew up. Quartets like the Citations performed there. I had no idea. Anyway, it's in this small basement of a place that might hold 150 people or so. As I'm walking down the stairs, there's this cacophony of sound. As I get to the bottom, there are quartets in every corner of the building singing, singing different songs in different keys. I think this must be what heaven is like. As I'm signing the guest book, I ask, how do I join? I get a laugh, but I was serious. I'm, I'm ready. As soon as I got my, hi, my name is Kevin Badge. I feel somebody grabbing my arm. I turn and the short man says, come here, boy. Okay. So he brings me over and there are three other guests along with three other members standing there. He hands me a just plain barbershop book, opens it up to my wild Irish rose, and says, sing. I said, okay, what part do you want me to sing? Now, I have no idea. I've never sung before. I've never sung until that night. I can read music, however. He says, sing, boy. It was the 1970s. So each section of the song, I sing a different part, just kind of testing out what each part does. I'm thinking they must think I'm horrible. I can't stay on a single part. They're going, holy cow, the kid reads music. So the meeting was magical. So much singing and fraternity. Everywhere I went, I kept asking, how do I join? How do I join? I cannot wait for next Thursday. Sunday, the phone rings. My dad answers, it's for me. And on the phone, I hear, hi, my name is Galen Forney. I heard you were at the chorus meeting last Thursday. I couldn't make it, but I heard you're a really good baritone. There are three of us wanting to sing in a quartet and we need a baritone. Are you interested? After wanting to sing Barbershop my entire life, in less than two weeks of knowing there's an actual society, I'm in Barbershop Quartet. Yay! So long story short, back in those days, most chapters actually restricted youth from being members. My chapter was absolutely no different. No, wonder, no one under 18 was allowed unless their father was a member. My dad had zero interest or time, so eventually enough guys convinced the board to change their bylaws. It's no wonder no one would answer my question. Now, in fairness, there was drinking and smoking at every rehearsal back then, so the reasoning was appropriate. 
Now let's get back to my father. This is the funny part. I told you, he told me your mother's friend's husband. Well, in 1978, we were smack dab in the middle of an energy crisis. My dad had been in a band pool for several years. Turns out that Bob is also a member of this band pool. Bob knows my dad is a great singer. Warren, when are you going to come out and sing with us? Warren, would you be interested in going to a show? Warren, would you buy tickets to our show every week? Warren. So when I said, I like barbershop, my dad went to Bob the next day and he said, here, Bob, take my firstborn, just leave me alone. <laughs> And oh, by the way, that guy who uh, dragged me uh, to sing my very first barbershop chords is one of my very best friends in barbershop still today, Jack Martin. He is still around uh, Cummings, Georgia, and still active in his chapter up in North Georgia. Uh, he took me under his wing. He taught me to love everything about barbershop, taught me to woodshed, and most importantly, my love of singing tags. One of the things that I decided to do early on during the pandemic was to write a tag a day. Well, I didn't do so well with that, but I have written almost 60 new tags to teach when we get back together. On the At Home series, we have sung together virtually, so why not learn an original tag that you can sing with your friends? I asked my buddy Tim Warwick to provide a learning track just between you and me, one day he could really be something. So here is the full mix. I encourage everybody to try every part. What is this thing called love? Okay, leads, let's start with you. The hardest part is actually finding your starting note. If you think like a baritone, drop down to the fifth and go up a half, that's your note. So sing that. Here it is again. What is this thing called love? All right. One more time, leads. What is this thing called love? Okay, now it's the bass's turn. Basses, when you hear the keynote, go up a half step, and that's your part. Basses are used to lifting up their shoulder a bit. After that, it's easy. What is this thing called love? Called love. Great, one more time. What is this thing called love? Called love. I love that penultimate bass note. Oh. Love that. All right, tenors. Again, finding your first note from the key is the hardest part. It's actually up a fourth. It doesn't sound like it, but bump, bump is sort of here comes the bride type. So let's take a stab at it. What is this thing called?
how can you not want to sing tenor when you hear Tim sing, call? How can you not love that? Teach a tenor that and they'll sign up for another year. Tenors note in the music that even though you have the same note on this, it really serves a different purpose in the chord. You go from the third of the chord to the flatted seventh of the chord. After you get started, just sit a tiny bit on this. That sort of move is called a tritone inversion. The old timers called it crossing the clock. And who doesn't love going from minor to major? And musicians call that a pickerty third. I just call it fun. So one more time. What is this thing called love? Called love. Well, the baritones, the baritones have already learned their part. It's actually the easiest part to learn. We'll play it through once for everybody else who isn't a baritone. Very same deal as the tenors. You start on the flatted seventh, and then you go to the major third on the word this. So even though it's the same note, it is definitely not the same pitch. Everybody swaps roles. Leads go from the fifth to the root. Bases go from the root to the fifth. So despite whatever notes are on the piano, we use our ears to tune that chord. What is this thing called love? Call. Call. Like I said, baritones only get one shot at it because they've already learned their part. Everybody, pick the part you love the best. Let's give it one more go. What is this thing called love? Thank you, Tim Warwick. He is the man. What a rock star. Such a great guy. All right. Now, I actually chose this tag of all of them for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's my favorite of the new tags that I've written. It's really quite simple. And most importantly, you can scream it for hours on end at conventions in the lobby. But at one time, there are a couple of things that would have been frowned upon. We would have heard people say, now that's not barbershop. One is the song choice. This is from Cole Porter. What is this thing called love? Definitely could not sing Cole Porter music for a couple of decades. The great American songbook was off limits. And this lyrical message didn't align with an anachronistic view of the style. That flat seven nine penultimate chord, that's the fancy music term, but that's that second to last chord uh, in the bass, that was a no-no for a couple of decades. You would have been penalized for such a grievance. But what I love most about this tag is Tim's performance of the tenor line on that penultimate chord. Now, when I sent it to Tim, I didn't have to tell him how I wanted to hear that tag being sung. He knew exactly what was in my head. What fun, call, he nails it, totally overbalanced. We probably wouldn't choose to sing properly that way, but I'm sorry, that's barbershop. And this all reminds me of a story that Joe Lyles told me that changed his view on barbershop. 
he had just joined the society and was quickly uh, made as director of the San Antonio Chordsmen, and he led them to several medals at International. Mo Rector, our first two-time gold medal winner, was in attendance at a rehearsal one night, and at a break, they were woodshedding. And Mo threw in a note that created an illegal chord back then by the rules of the day. Joe stopped and he said, Mo, that isn't barbershop. Now, Mo in his Southwestern drawl said, yeah, but ain't it fun? Joe's heart when it came to barbershop was changed in that moment. I often think we take ourselves way too seriously about preservation of the barbershop style when some of us are so worried about all of the small details. There's nothing not barbershop about the tag I just presented. And even if there was, by someone's definition, my response would be the same as Moe's. Yeah, but ain't it fun? Early barber shoppers explored new chords. That's being a barber shopper. Singing that tenor penultimate note way over balanced. Yeah, but ain't it fun? If we were challenged with only preserving one thing from our barber shop culture, I would vote to preserve tag singing. It is the gateway to share barber shop with the world. It is the gateway for us to connect musically with each other even if we've never met each other. If we aren't using tags to recruit members, we're missing the boat. Hearing your voice in a chord, making it ring, who needs anything more convincing? So with all of that, let's really start actually talking about preservation. As someone who has sung in two high profile choruses, Local Majority and Ambassadors of Harmony, has been an arranger of some music that isn't always considered traditional barbershop. And as a music judge and chair of contest and judging, I often hear that's not barbershop. I thought the P stood for preservation. Or in the last 15 years, we dropped preservation out of our name. You've heard many variations on this constant theme. When changes happen that we don't like, we bring up the word preservation. But what no one really remembers is that the style in our society has been constantly evolving since 1938. In fact, the style was evolving prior to 1938. Whenever anybody brings up the word preservation, it really deals with preservation of barbershop when I joined the society. And frankly, that truly resonates with me as well. Our society is nothing like what it was in 1978 when I joined, much less 68, 58, 48, or 38, or for that matter, 88, 2008, or 2018. It has always changed over time and always will. So in reality, barbershop singing was saved in 1938, thanks in large part to O.C. and Rupert inviting their friends and colleagues to a meeting. Through the early growth of SPBS QSA, our barbershop singing was preserved. In the early recordings and the harmonizers, you find that it was actually the duty of every chapter to sponsor other chapters. All of us, all of us were charged with the growth of the society, not of preserving barbershop per se. Although we lost the word propagation in our title almost immediately, our job as members in those early years was to propagate the society. Propagation ensured preservation. At some point, we had successfully propagated the society and began supporting propagation around the world. Our records and albums became available to both members and non-members. Our shows reached large audiences in every city and town across the country. Awareness of both barbershop music and the society was increased. Now, perhaps not to our hopes or dreams and aspirations, but it was. And through the Music Man, Andy Williams Show, Jackie Gleason Show, and many other TV venues, we put barbershop harmonies into households across the country. 
The internet, Facebook, and YouTube have solidified an undeniable truth. Barbershop quartet singing is preserved forever. Now with the internet, the internet is strewn with barbershop performances. Nothing ever goes away on the internet. Even if every single barbershopper past and present were to disappear, were to go away, someone will stumble across those videos and find three others to replicate it. And if we don't think that's true, look to the quartets of Barber Drunk, Oh Boy, and other quartets around the world where no barbershop exists. Our style is incredibly powerful and appealing. People will sing it forever. Therefore, barbershop is preserved. I will repeat this point, barbershop is preserved. Even with a pandemic, the style of barbershop singing will prevail. For 80 plus years, people have argued, well, that's not barbershop. In the future, new barbershoppers will follow us and argue, well, that's not barbershop. However, at the end of the day, whatever it is, it does find itself closest to the tenets of barbershop harmony. So what's the point to all of this? Here it is. Do we think the Barbershop Harmony Society is worth preserving? That really is the question at hand. And anytime I do a talk on leadership, I always ask this question. Our actions as leaders and our chapters are directed towards preserving our individual choruses and chapters, which in turn preserve the society. We have seen membership declines over the last 40 years. It's probably my fault because I joined at the peak. Um, we have seen strong, once strong chapters fall by the wayside. This alone, however, doesn't threaten our society. We have found ways to adapt and succeed. But never in my wildest dreams did I foresee a pandemic would severely threaten our society. If we can't meet and sing, how do we go on? I have been blessed, truly blessed over these past 11 months to be invited into your home, homes on Zoom calls. I have given all sorts of talks on different aspects of barbershop. For over seven months, I had at least two evenings a week I was in calls. In every meeting, I watched and listened to how that chorus and chapter is doing. There actually are a lot of similarities. Some are great and inspiring and some are are concerning. So on the great and inspirational side, choruses are doing whatever they can to keep their members engaged. Despite lower numbers than in person, people are still engaged and connected. We have taken the time to learn more about our hobby than we would have normally. Directors are usually actually pretty protective of their rehearsal and chapter time. Choruses have had access to barbershop legends that they normally wouldn't have. I found that there are people who are even more diehard about barbershop than I am and about our future. Uh, people can visit other chapters virtually, never had that option before. Members who have moved away have been able to reconnect with their chorus and their friends. Choruses and quartets have reached out to the greater society to open their doors and connect with us. We had one of the greatest events of all time, the Legends Championship. That would have never happened. It brought generations of barbershoppers together and revealed the greatness of groups that we might not have appreciated before. And finally, and most importantly, people care more about each other than they do barbershop. On the concerning side, Typically, attendance is less than 50% of the active chorus membership. And there is a noticeable fatigue in moving forward virtually. A couple of decades ago, I needed to take a break from singing with the ambassadors. I was, I was visiting David Wright and letting him know that I would be inactive for a while. He said something that was profound at the time. He says a lot of profound things. He said that this is fragile. It takes all of us to continually invest ourselves 
to ensure that it keeps moving forward. It would not take all that much for things to fall apart. And I've discovered that he was right. This is true. Despite having been a member for almost 43 years, I've not been active in my chorus for at least 10 of those years, if not more. Life gets in the way, school, career, family, other responsibilities and priorities. It's really hard to be active all the time. But fortunately, there's enough guys that are there to keep things going while others take a break. However, there is a universal truth at work at all times. The longer you are away, the less you miss it. So people are always at risk of not coming back or at least not coming back for many, many years. Because of my statistics background, I have performed two BHS membership studies in the past dozen years. The first one was somewhere in the order of 2008, 2009, and the last one was in 2018. There were many insights into behaviors of our members uh, as it related to attrition and retention. But remarkably, the trends were quite similar across this time. Now, I have no idea what the pandemic has, has done and will do, but if we go back a couple of years, something really remarkable about our society was true. As people stay, the probability that they renew another year increases. So what, is exact, what is, exactly does that mean? For this past decade, when we get new members in the door, we lose a third of them in the first year. 67% remain. Now of those who remain, there's a probability that 80% will sign up for the year after that. And it keeps steadily increasing until year number 10, when the probability of renewing is almost 90%. In the 2000s, the average lifetime member was just under five years. But in the past decade, it actually projects that the average lifetime will actually be over seven years. We're actually getting better at retaining the members that we have. So what's the problem? We weren't recruiting enough members. We just expected that they would seek us out and walk in our doors. We expect that they would be just like me. And that's not true. I saw this firsthand with choruses not actively working on filling their risers. You know it's good. You, you, you stick around because it's really a lot of fun. It's great. And if somebody actually walks in the door, they'll see how great it is and they'll wanna be a part of it too. But most people aren't looking to walk in our doors. We weren't selling ourselves and we weren't competing actively for singers who are out there. The fact that our retention improves as a function of years of service only shows that our value proposition is remarkably strong. In fact, incredibly strong. Now, people leave the society for all sorts of reasons. Families moving away, changes, frustration, and sadly, illness and death are certainly all valid reasons. Yet the numbers reflect similar projections year after year. So this is no longer just my opinion, but in the actions of countless thousands of members, what we have here is worth preserving. Our society is worth preserving. Now, if you know me at all, you know that what I'm about to say is gospel truth. I am not a Pollyanna. I do not look at the world through rose-colored glasses. I am not an optimist. I am not a cheerleader. Through my training in my professional career, I always plan for the worst and hope for the best. And so as I see it, there are two paths going forward. I see many chapters that I've been blessed to visit taking path number one. I've seen very few chapters discussing path number two. So path number one is keeping the members engaged in a variety of ways and assuming when it is safe to return that everyone will come back. My belief is that the adage I shared earlier, 
the longer you are away, the less you miss it is in work. It's creeping in. I see it in the participation of, of the calls versus the actual chorus size. I hear it in the fatigue of, of those who are on the Zoom call. There is a damage that this pandemic is taking on each of our choruses overtly as well as hidden. We can't leverage our strongest assets. Our strongest assets being our music and our ability to be human with each other. For some of us, we're just waiting it out. We're the diehards. We'll be back when it is safe, guaranteed. But for others who haven't become as invested in the same way, those numbers I cited may actually no longer be true. They might have already moved on to something else. To not be actively planning in retaining and recruiting will spell the end of many of our choruses in this society. Not all, of course, of course not, but there will be damage. And perhaps not immediately, but going forward. We all know the feeling of being a part of something that is decaying. Some of us stick with it and try to prop it up while others just bail. It's not what they joined up for and it's no longer fun. Pretty soon it becomes not worth saving. I do hope I'm wrong about this, but I'm seeing all sorts of signs that many of our chapters and choruses are going to follow this path. Path number two, however, is an exciting path. If every member, chorus, chapter, district in our society embraced path number two, our society would see an exciting new future with new growth. We have the time in 2021 before, before it is safe to return to decide which path to take. It's your decision which path to take. For me, as a proud member of BHS, Today, I'm working on path number two. If you know me, if, I, if, you, if we've ever crossed paths or we've worked together, you know I'm always motivated by profound thoughts. I shared one earlier that David uh, shared. I might not understand at the time what I've heard, but I always remember those moments. They're, they're deep and I know they are. If you've ever been coached by me, I am confident I've shared some of these that are meaningful to me. So I'm gonna share one. I've always believed in the following quote, when the student is ready, the teacher arrives. In the early 1990s, I was falling into depression. I was becoming more and more disillusioned with the path that my life had taken. I was considering all sorts of changes in my life to quote unquote, turn things around, including dropping my membership in the society. I actually did resign from ambassadors and thankfully David Wright convinced me to stay. I wasn't accomplishing the things that I'd wanted to accomplish in my life and certainly not in barber shopping. And I was realizing it wasn't gonna happen anytime soon, if not at all. My participation was stopping me from pursuing other potential interests that might turn things around for me. Now, about at that same time, Lou Holtz was on the road doing motivational speeches. And for those who don't know who Lou Holtz is, he uh, was one of the premier college football coaches. He coached Notre Dame to a national championship just a few years before that. And as coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks, in the late 70s, he led them to one of the largest upsets in college football history. After hearing him speak live, he can motivate anyone, including me at a very low point in my life. He spoke of being fired as a coach early in his career, shortly after his last child was born. His family had no income, he had no job, and he was rapidly becoming depressed. He then told the story of what changed his life. Sorry, it's just a little emotional for me. He sat down with a pen and paper and began writing down everything that he wanted to accomplish in his life. 
Now, this wasn't a bucket list of, of places to go or things to do. However, these were aspirational dreams. Two of those on his list were to become the head football coach at Notre Dame, one of the premier programs in the country, and winning a national championship. Here's a coach that's been fired. What inspired me most as I listened to his story is that he shared the more he wrote, the more excited he became about his life while he was at an emotional bottom. I was at an emotional bottom. So I drove home from that talk that night and rather than going to bed, I grabbed a pen and paper. I began to write and write and write. When I got done, I had four pages filled with dreams and aspirations, things I wanted to accomplish in my life, being married, having a family, having grandchildren, accomplishing things in my career, and so on. And just like Lou Holtz said, I became more and more excited as I wrote. I could feel the dark cloud lifting that night, the more I wrote, because everything I wrote down was possible, and I felt like I had a direction. So I got to change courses here. All right, in business, there is a, a concept called design thinking. This is employed by companies that are interested in developing new products and services for their customers. There are four steps to design thinking. The first is what is. What's our current state? Where are we today? And that's pretty easy. All of us can do this pretty effortlessly. The second step is the exciting one. What if? What if? That's where you get to dream unencumbered by what's been done in the past or not done in the past. This is exactly the advice of Lou Holtz. What if we had 100 members? What if we sang for 10,000 people next year? What if we aligned with our local symphony orchestra for a concert? What if we did a concert and sold 1,000 tickets? And so on. It's, un it's unbounded, it's unlimited but only you and your chorus can write that list. Harmony Hall can't write it, board of directors can't do it, the district can't do it, but you can. And I promise you, it's actually fun once you get started. So step three is what wows? What can your membership get behind and get excited about? You can't do it all, but the members are your resources to make things go. What wows them? Narrow down that list to those. Finally, step four is what works. Perhaps not everything that wows can be done, but there are things that definitely can be done. And this is what inspires us and gives us purpose. It fuels us, it rallies us, and it drives us forward. Coming back to our current reality, we know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We know that there will be a time when we can safely return. We just don't know when, but that doesn't stop us from planning for that time. We can plan today, right now. We can do everything associated with that plan shy of putting down dates. We can plan for an exciting tomorrow. Now there is nothing good about this pandemic. Many lives have been lost and many careers, businesses, and finances have been seriously disrupted. But it has provided some insight and it's provided an opportunity for our, our society to grow in unprecedented ways. We have learned that we are social creatures. We need to affiliate. Even being a self-proclaimed wallflower I cannot wait to be with people again. But the inability for people to affiliate has cre created a tremendous opportunity for us going forward. People will be looking for something to participate in when this is over. There is a pent up demand to participate in something meaningful outside of the home. People need what our society has to offer. 
even though Harm everyone in Harmony was not planned to handle a pandemic, the infrastructure is in place for us to expand our own chapters in society in any way we see fit. But here's my prediction. The window of opportunity will be open for a very short time. Once time passes after it is safe, we'll return, we'll, we will return to a world where we soon forget the events of 2020. It is human nature to forget what causes us pain. After a period of time, we will fall back into predictable and comfortable patterns. That window will close. So the time to dream is now, not later. The time to plan is now, not later. This is path number two. It could lead to a society previously existing only in our dreams. But it is up to you and me not to Harmony Hall, not to the board of directors, not to our district leaders. For years, I've heard chapters wanting Harmony Hall to help them solve their problems. Here's the truth. They don't want Harmony Hall to help them with their problems. They want Harmony Hall to fix their problems. Sorry, that isn't happening. You have to do it. All Harmony Hall and the districts can do is provide resources but they can't or won't fix it. We have to do more at this time to preserve and grow. Now, I'm first in line. I have been guilty historically of not recruiting members. I have, I'm not a salesman. In fact, I will do anything I can not to be involved with sales. Everyone I know knows I'm involved in barbershop and they quasi know what that is, but I, I've never actively invited people. That will change when it is safe. I've already identified four people that I will actively recruit and I won't stop there. I have fond memories of great barbershoppers availing themselves at conventions and other activities, singing songs, wood shedding, teaching tags, and just hanging around with Joe barbershoppers like me. I have been guilty the last couple of decades of not teaching tags like I used to. At conventions, rather than singing in the lobby or hanging out, I would just go crash and go to sleep. All of that will change when it is safe to return. I will aspire to be like those people that I idolized in my barbershop youth. I will be available, not unavailable. I will continue to be of service to those who ask for my help, but with a new perspective. For me, this is about preserving and growing the society that I fell in love with 43 years ago and will be thriving long after I'm gone. For whatever reasons, last year I was humbled beyond words to be inducted into the Barbershop Harmony Society's Hall of Fame. I feel totally unworthy of, of such an honor. Anything that I've done has been attempting to give back what our society gave an awkward and lost 16 year old. <laughs> Sorry. It has literally given me everything in my life since that point. Now it could be really easy for me and likely several of you listening to say, well, I've done my part. I've given a lot over the years and looking back on it, I've had a great run. I've had a great ride. It was great. However, you have my word on this. Whatever I might have done in the past to promote and preserve barbershop will pale in comparison to what I will do going forward. I ask all of you to join me in that pledge in your own way. It is time to not just preserve our society. It is time to grow our society. It will take all of us giving in our own ways. If we all commit to path number two and use this time to plan for the future, to plan our future, individually 
as well as collectively, we will see a future that will engage in ways we never dream. I believe with all of my heart that if we choose a bigger future and commit to that, it will be there for us. In closing, I love all of you. I miss you beyond words. And I can't wait to see you again and sing.